Today is the 17th day of the month of Cheshvan. We are in the middle of chapter 12, discussing the laws of preparations for prayer. Today we'll be doing the paragraph 11 through the end of chapter 12, which is paragraph 15. And we'll be doing the first paragraph of chapter 13, which discusses the laws of the sanctity of synagogues and study halls. So chapter 12, paragraph 11. There's a mitzvah to show excitement to come to a synagogue or to a study hall, and the way that we do that is by running there. We go going quickly. However, we should make sure that when we actually get to the synagogue, it's not appropriate to come running inside. Before entering, we stop, we take a pause, we are supposed to be a bit mindful, we're about to enter a place where God's presence is located, and there's a bit of heaviness we're supposed to feel. Again, going back to the analogy of if we're facing a king or a great ruler, We'd go in with a certain presence of mind. When going into a synagogue, we should have that sort of presence of mind. There's definitely this balancing act of making sure that the synagogue is a place where it's comfortable to be, but at the same time, a place which we respect and are careful about. There's a beautiful idea. It's not an obligation, but a beautiful idea of not of coming into the synagogue already wearing our talus and tefillin in the morning. So if somebody lives in an area which is fully Jewish, fully observant, then people will will put on the talus and tefillin in their home and walk to shul, travel to shul, wearing a talus and tefillin. If somebody lives in a place where there's non-Jews around also, it's not not appropriate to be walking on the street in that case wearing a talus and tefillin. And so therefore, it's a nice idea to put on talus and tefillin in the entrance room to the synagogue, in some other room, in the hallway maybe, and then when you come into the sanctuary itself, you're already all set for prayers. Again, this is an obligation if it's not your custom, it's fine. If it's not done in the place where you pray, it's fine. But if it could be done, it's a beautiful thing to be able to do. Paragraph 12. If one can't make it to a synagogue for services, so they're not going to have a minion, then it's best to try arranging a minion in your house. If you can't do that, then it's next best to at least pray at a time when there's a minion going on. That way your prayers, even though you're not physically with a minion, your prayers are able to, so to speak, hook onto the minion's prayers and also be uplifted on the wings of the minion's prayers. If a person lives in a place where there's no regular minion, also they should try to schedule their service the time that they pray in their home this to be the same time that there's a prayer going on in a nearby city with the minion. However, if waiting till that time period means that you're going to end up maybe getting distracted, getting caught up in business, if you have other stuff to do, then don't wait for that minion time where they're praying in the synagogue. Instead, pray first thing in the morning and then you start your day. But of course, if there's a minion around, you make, got to make sure to wait for that minion. Paragraph 13. If someone is very weak or you know, they need to eat, they have to take medication with, with food, whatever it is, so they have to have a proper meal earlier in the day before services might begin in the synagogue, then it's best for them to daven at home earlier, to pray at home earlier, and then when they finish prayers, they have their meal. This is better than having a meal and then going to the synagogue for prayers. However, says the Kitzvah Chanarach, it's not appropriate if there's going to be a minion in the synagogue. It's counterintuitively, you might think, especially if you're, if you're praying without a minion, go to the synagogue to pray. If there's going to be a minion later on in the morning and you're praying early, it's not appropriate, says the Kitzvah Chanarach, to do that, to pray your early prayer by yourself in the synagogue. It's almost like disrespectful. There's going to be a minion there later, but I'm going to go there and dive in earlier without the minion. Nope. If you have to pray by yourself, at least do it in your home, not in the, not in the synagogue, or where there will be a minion later on. Paragraph 14. There are those that have a custom that once a minion takes place in a synagogue, you're not supposed to make a second minion in the synagogue unless it's previously scheduled. But if it wasn't scheduled, you don't make just throw another minion because that makes it look as if like the first minion wasn't good enough, we needed a second minion. However, says the kids, are, there are different places that have different customs, and if it's not, the, we go with whatever the custom of the, of the synagogue is. So I've never seen this custom that once a minion happens, you can't make another minion there. And therefore, I think nowadays, definitely the, well, at least the most widespread custom is whoever wants to make a minion comes together to make a minion regardless of what services happened in the synagogue earlier in the day. Paragraph 15. Having a synagogue or a study hall in a town is an extremely important thing to the point where community members are able to f- compel other community members to pitch in to build a synagogue, to build a study hall. Nowadays, this isn't so practical because we don't have our own government-sanctioned Jewish community structure. It used to be that in European cities, at least, 
that the government would recognize the Jewish community and the heads of the Jewish community were able to tax members of the Jewish community. So if a synagogue had to be built, they could impose a tax, the Jewish community leaders could impose a tax that would be legally binding by the country on the Jewish community members and they'd be able they'd be able to use that money to build the synagogue. Nowadays, we don't, be, especially in America, we have separation of church and state. Such a thing obviously doesn't exist. But, however, the idea that it's important to have, a, to have a synagogue in every community definitely holds true. And if one is being built, then it's important to chip in to help out with building that synagogue. Chapter 13. Laws of the Sanctity of a Synagogue and a Study Hall. So this requires a bit of an introduction. Already in last chapter, we discussed synagogues and study halls, shuls, and base medrash, I called it, in a few paragraphs. What are these two different things? So it used to be that there were synagogues or places to pray. In Hebrew, it's called a base knesses. In Yiddish, it's called a shul. And a study hall, in Hebrew, we called a base medrash, was a place where people study Torah. And there are two different buildings which had two different functions. However, the rules about how to treat them are basically the same. And nowadays, most synagogues have plenty of people studying Torah in them. Most places that maybe even are set aside to study Torah usually have prayers going on, and they kind of blended together. So paragraph one. This is a bit similar to what we discussed in last chapter, that we have to realize that synagogues, study halls, these are holy places, special places. In these buildings, these rooms, we connect to God. It's not a place for idle chatter, schmoozing, catching up. We're, we're supposed to be mindful about being there, mindful about praying, about connecting to God, about Torah study. There's a certain heaviness that we're supposed to feel when we're in a building, in a synagogue or a study hall, a building which, which has God's presence in it. Now again, like I mentioned in last chapter, that this comes across, there's a balancing act over here that on the one hand, we do want to make it comfortable. As a matter of fact, in synagogue in Hebrew is called a base knesses, a house of gathering. Now, the main, the, ba- the the most basic level is a house of gathering for for the community to come together to gather to pray. L- literally, really a house of congregating, but it's also time a place to come together as a community. So there's definitely a place to connect with each other in a synagogue as well. But it's not just meant to be shooting the breeze, schmoozing, catching up on the latest gossip. We should be mindful in a synagogue that we're standing in the presence of God. Two things specifically which a Kit Aruch says are appropriate that we should do in a synagogue as a sign of respect, as he says, make sure that the floor is always swept. You know, and though it used to be that the floors were were made were dirt, and as he talks about sprinkling uh, water on the floor in order to like flatten out the floor to make it a bit smoother, obviously that's not relevant nowadays. But the practical example for nowadays would be to make sure it's swept and mopped properly. Also, he mentions Make sure there's uh, there's lights. There's a it's a well lit place. It's a place you can see properly. It's not like dim lit that you can't see properly in there. One other interesting rule which a synagogue and a study hall has is that we're not supposed to kiss our children in a synagogue or in a study hall. It's a place to show love and focus on our love between us and God. And if we show in such a strong way by kissing our children, the love between us and our children. It detracts, so to speak, from the focus on God. And therefore, a synagogue is not a place that we should be we should be kissing our children. I think a hug is is fine, and hugs are done, but we shouldn't be kissing our children in a synagogue or in a study hall. This concludes today's learning. Have a wonderful day and see you tomorrow.